Praise the Lord, church. I'd like to welcome everyone back to another online service. As the pastor says, hope that everyone's staying saved and safe. I'd just like to go over a few quick announcements for everyone. Remember, if you have any prayer requests, names to add to the prayer list, or any praise reports, please send those to cljcrequests at gmail.com. Uh, since we're unable to pass around the, the fasting calendar, please continue up to do your, your normal dates. Uh, if you're feeling extra generous, you know, throw a few extra meals on there. Well, we need fasting 24-7 during this time. Uh, remember when all of our videos drop, uh, it's 8 a.m. on YouTube for Sundays, 10 a.m. on Facebook for Sunday service. Uh, Brother Thomas's lessons on Wednesdays are available on Wednesday at 5 p.m. on both platforms, as well as our Sunday school lessons that drop on Friday night are available on YouTube and Facebook at 5 p.m. Uh, just want to continue to let everyone know that while we're down here, we're continuing to pray over the names of the box, the soldiers, everything that the elders prayed for when we had service. We're continuing to pray for those things, and also the pastor is continuing to read out the names on the prayer list, and he's continuing to pray for them daily. Lastly, we just want to continue to thank everyone that makes this possible. Uh, thank the choir for the songs. Thank Brandon Need for opening their house up to me. I uh, thank for, for everyone that gets the messages ready. Those are down here recording, everyone that edits, uploads, and any part that you played in this. We just want to thank everyone. We thank the pastor for trusting us to do this, and most of all, we want to thank God for making this possible. So. If you guys need anything, need help with anything, need someone to talk to, just if you need anything at all, just reach out to us, call, text, email, stop by, whatever it is. We love you guys. We want to help you, and we hope to see you soon. Thank you.
Praise the Lord, church. I'd like to welcome everyone back to another online service this week. As always, if you miss the major announcements, please feel free to, to rewind and catch those. Uh, remember to send any prayer requests, praise reports, names to add to the prayer list to cljcrequests at gmail.com. And again, we're asking everyone to continue and pray and fast for Zach Carter. If you take your Bibles to Hebrews 12, 1 through 3, Hebrews 12, 1 through 3. It says, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight in the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, and despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him that endureth such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. And then if you go to 2 Timothy 4, 2-8, 2 Timothy 4, 2-8. It says, Preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust they shall heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth, and shall be turned unto fables. But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight, I have finished my course, I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at the day, and not only to me, but unto all them that also that love his appearing. Today I simply want to title this, Finishing Your Course. Finishing Your Course. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, God, we love you, God, we praise you, God, we thank you, God. Thank you for your mercy and your grace and your blessings, everything you've done for us, God. Again, thank you for keeping cancer out of the church, our travelers safe, our soldiers safe, our children safe. God, we're not worthy of everything you've done for us, God. And you keep blessing us time and time again. And God, we're so grateful for those blessings. We never want to, you know, let that slide or take those for granted. God, we always want to thank you for those things. Ask the Lord to bless the service. God, use it for the building of your kingdom. God, give me a word of knowledge and a word of seeds. Give me a timely word, God. Let your people be faithful in watching these videos, God. Let us see that we, if we need a course adjustment, that you're the one that can fix that course, and God. You can adjust us, and you can get us on the straight and narrow, because what matters in the end is, God, where we finish our course, and we want to do what it takes to make it into heaven. God, I ask you, Lord, to bless your church. God, bless the pastor. Give wisdom and knowledge in this time. God, keep your people unified. Keep your people faithful in church and faithful to you, God. Touch all those that are suffering with this virus, all those that are fighting on the front lines, all those that have lost loved ones, God. God, move them. God, speak that word of healing, God, to, to wipe this virus out, to do what it takes to, to get us in the church, God, without restrictions, because we know it's almost been a year, God, and we'll continue waiting on you, but we want to be back in your house again. God, bless our leaders of our nation, God, bring peace God, bring love. Uh, just You can take all this division, everything away from our nation. God, you can move for it, Lord. God, we give you all the praise and the glory for it, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen, Lord. Thank you. Thank you. you may be seated, as Brother Dwayne likes to say. Uh, a week or so ago, I was driving home, and, and last week it was, you know, my my week off it was the week out of rotation where I'm I'm not on camera so I had no lesson to prepare that week I'm driving home thinking about maybe getting a, a head start for this this message and I begin to ask her I'm like you know wh what do you want me to talk about and at that time Benedict Arnold popped into my head and it made me think for a minute and I'm like him you know you know really Lord I'm use him as a reference point in a message, but then it began to, to make sense to me what he was wanting me to talk about. And if you'll bear with me for a moment, Pastor, just, just give me a few minutes to tell the story about this man, Benedict Arnold, because it is a, a story worth telling. Benedict Arnold was one of the top military men this country had ever produced. George Washington gets a lot of the credit during the Revolution because he's George Washington. A lot of people are biased towards him, but Without Benedict Arnold, there's a good chance things may have turned out just a tad bit differently because in Washington's command, there were quite a few inept commanders and a couple who are today suspected of treasonous activities. But Arnold wasn't one of these inept commanders. He was one of the best and one of the brightest. He led the, 
the capture of Fort Ticonderoga, which in turn netted us some artillery pieces that we needed that Henry Knox was able to, to sled through in the snow to, to Boston. It's something we desperately needed, and once those cannons arrived, it persuaded the British to give up their occupation of Boston and then help move them into New York and isolate that theater of the war, and it was critical to the war effort, what he did that day. He was part of the incursions that we made into Canada. In the Battle of Quebec, he was shot in the leg and had to be removed from the field of battle. And though the British would eventually drive us back out of Canada, you know, we were outnumbered. He led, he led a, a great defense and helped create one of America's first navies and led one of our first naval battles on Lake Champlain. He was a, a brilliant man, but even though we lost that campaign in Canada, it helped bog down the British for another fighting season and helped delay their invasion from Canada. In 1777, he led a small force trying to stop the British from taking a supply depot in Connecticut. And here again, he was shot in the exact same leg. And now comes the peak of his career and, and what was what's dubbed the, the major turning point in the Revolutionary War, and that's the battles of Saratoga. Army politics and, and infighting and his personality and other generals' personalities kept him grounded on the, the first day of battle, or the first series of battles. But in the second one, he was told to stay in his tent, but he directly disobeyed those orders and rode off in a fury towards the fighting. And he rode through the thickest of the gunfire, and he remained unscathed. And he led a charge that helped break down the British lines, that helped make them to crumble, that caused them to retreat. And once more, he was shot again in the exact same leg. His actions, once again, helped delay or helped nullify the, a British threat from a second invasion from Canada. It showed the French and other European nations that we were more than just a bunch of angry farmers. It, it led to loans that we desperately needed. It led to guns, to, to manpower, to naval support that we needed. An American hero was Benedict Arnold. Three times he shed his own blood for the cause of liberty. After being shot the third time, he was reported to say, it would have been better had I been shot in the chest than in the leg. And if only that had been his case, if only his words back then had come true for his cause, then he would have went down as an early American hero. But we know, if you're taking a basic history class, that's not how his story ends. There are not really any Benedict Arnold squares like there are Lafayette squares or, or you know, cities named after George Washington. So Washington puts him in charge of Philadelphia as he recuperates. And long story short, army politics were involved, extreme pettiness on all sides, disgruntled over lack of promotions, and Arnold finds himself in a very dark place. And he begins to hang around the wrong people. He begins to hang out with the loyalists in Philadelphia. And, and people say, often say the worst decision George Washington ever made was putting Arnold in charge of Philadelphia because he was a man not prepared for that task. And these loyalists, those were the ones opposing the revolution, the ones loyal to the king, the ones who Arnold had shed his blood three times fighting against. But he begins to hang out with them day after day, and eventually he marries a prominent young loyalist named Peggy Shippen, who just happened to be tight with one of the chief spies in New York for the British. And this leads him down the path of betrayal, offering to sell West Point to the British, commanding British troops to fight against Americans capturing Richmond, burn up the Virginia countryside, and eventually in a battle in Connecticut, when American soldiers surrendered, he went ahead and slaughtered them, even though they had surrendered. And y'all know I love history. It's, it's my bread and butter. But all the great things that Arnold had did for this country, aside from helping at Ticonderoga and a brief mention, at the Battle of Saratoga is nothing I ever learned in school. It wasn't until a few years ago when I began researching the topic that I found all these things out. I knew about his betrayal because Benedict Arnold, that's a name synonymous with the word traitor. And that man, Benedict Arnold, should be a lesson to us all because it doesn't matter where you started or what good you did in the middle of your life. What matters is how you finish your race. Did you persevere? Did you give all that you had or did you simply give up or like him, did you switch sides? Did you begin to work with the enemy, the one you so desperately fought against to begin with? Did you change your directions? There are paths upon paths upon paths, different roads that we can all take through this life, but they all whittle down to two different finish lines. There are two finish lines that you can cross and there's no turning back once you cross 
either one. One means your name is written down in the book, and the other leads to nothing but a life of torment. If you're alive and breathing, if you guys haven't blasphemed yet, then the race you're running still is not over. And I don't know if the Lord's trying to talk to one specific person today or if he's trying to drill something into our heads collectively that we need to understand. But if you guys notice over the past few months, he's given us points and points. And, you know, several of them have been about, you know, correcting your course or, you know, being on the straight and narrow. I believe the pastor preached the message, look to yourselves. We had a Sunday school lesson about considering your ways. There's been others that have been, you know, where are you spending eternity at? They've been focused on or examining where you are with your walk with God. And now it's not exactly the time to give up on that walk or to turn around. Brother Dwayne talked about it uh, in, in Friday's lesson about having the vision, you know, examine your sight right now and examine yourselves and, and look down that road. Is your vision fixed on getting to heaven? Is it focused on the finish line or have you begun to lose sight of that thing you once ran towards? And I, I know how surprisingly easy it is to, to, to lose vision for it to creep up on you, you know, without you even knows and with what happened with me the the first thing that goes your peripheral vision and most people are like well if I was losing my peripheral vision I'm pretty sure I would notice it but unless it's something you've experienced it's really hard to understand just how easy it is to lose that vision and I don't know when the tears in the, the retinal tissue started but I kept working I kept doing the same thing that I'd done day after day after day that I'd done in the past and I did not realize that it was causing damage to me until one day I woke up and all I could see was a black cloud out of one eye. But by then, it was too late. I'd already lost the vision. Several months later, after more surgeries that I had, I had a significant tear in, in my left eye. And even though I knew all the signs to look for, you know, all the problems to look for, it still crept up on me. On the ride home from that last procedure, I, I took my sunglasses off my eyes and adjusted um, from the lasers finally. And I noticed that I was able to see again the top of my leg down to my kneecap and it amazed me and I was like wow I, d I didn't notice this was gone and of course my mom's in the back seat and she's like well why didn't you say something if you didn't know you could see it and I'm like well mom it, if I'd known that I would have said something but you know it disappeared and it did not really you know did not catch my eye no pun intended but it it, it like the song says it, it was a slow fade things happen and a slow fade and nowadays I do a vision check multiple times a day so if you see me waving my hand like this or you know doing this you know I'm sorry Larry J I'm not doing the, the FSU tomahawk chop I'm doing a vision check to make sure I know I still have my peripheral vision because if I can't see my hand to a certain side then I realize I'm losing that vision and so that's something we should all do daily in our spiritual lives is to check our vision and are you guys focusing on the course or are your eyes set upon the finish line is that view getting hazy or is it not no longer even there if if that's the case then right now is the time to hit pause and hit your knees and talk to God right away because if you don't adjust your course right now you may find yourself on the wrong side of judgment day why do people give up or why do people give in and studying about Benedict Arnold I couldn't help think of a man called Demas twice he was mentioned in the same sentence as Luke the beloved physician as Paul said Paul even calls Demas a fellow laborer now we don't know much about the life of Demas or anything but it's pretty apparent that he was active in the church for Paul to call him out by name for Paul of, of all people he was a, a strict and a stern man if he called you a fellow laborer that means you were in there you were doing the work that you're supposed to be doing and he was with Paul all the way up and towards the end and he no doubt experienced some of the exact same hardships fought the same battles that Paul fought it may have been a walk beside Paul in some of those battles that he fought but at the very last minute Demas threw in the towel why is that Paul said he's forsaken me because he has loved this present world Paul himself was determined to finish and he knew what was on the other side of that finish line. We read it earlier, but I'd like to read it again in 2 Timothy 4, 7 through 8. He says, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at the day, and not only to me, but unto all them also that love his appearing. 
the, the race Paul was running was not about this world. It, it was about the world that came after right. this world. The road from point A to point B was not going to be an easy one. It wasn't going to be a fun road. There, it led to beatings. It led to prison. But yet he still continued to press on. But Demas decided to give up at the last minute. He put so much work. Uh, like I said, he was called a fellow laborer. He put work into the church. And then when it came down time to lay it on the line, he gave it all up. He threw in the towel because he loved this present world. And how sad a story that is to run and run and run and then give up at the last minute. I heard a man preach one time that he and his wife went to Ireland to, to help out some missionaries. And one day, I believe it was their last day of the trip, they decided to go for a hike and they spotted some cliffs in the distance. And so they went to them and they began to climb and they kept climbing and they kept climbing. Eventually they got tired of climbing. They gave up and turned around and went back to the missionary's house. And upon returning back, the missionary asked, how far did you guys make it in your trip? What all did you get to see? And so they began to tell them the story about how they climbed and climbed, but they, they quit climbing. The missionary says, what a shame. He said, if you had just went another 10 to 20 feet higher, you would have reached the top and seen some of the most beautiful sights you could have seen in all of Ireland. The man said, I felt sick upon hearing that. He said, I could have took my hat off and threw it and probably reached the top of that cliff, but I didn't even know it. I came so close to seeing something beautiful, but I missed out on it because I gave up right at the last minute. And time had ran out on their trip to Ireland, and he was so close but now he'll always have that, that thought in his head that, that what, what could have been thought, you know, what could have been, what I could have seen that day. And you don't want to spend eternity thinking what could have been, but right now it's not too late to change your course. You don't have to spend eternity thinking what could have been. The Bible is covered with people that God turned around, that God changed their course. We just talked about Paul, and I doubt there's been a week during this whole pandemic that's went by that not at least one of us has mentioned Paul and his story. And that's really a testament to the power of God, the changing power of God. The perfect, Paul is the perfect example to all of us that where you are right now in your life, you know, if it's in a bad spot, it doesn't have to determine where you end up for eternity. You know, your present situation doesn't have to determine your future outcome. Acts chapter 8, 1 through 3 says... And Saul was consenting unto his death, this is talking about Stephen, and at the time there was a great persecution against the church which was at Jerusalem, and they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria except the apostles. And a devout, <coughs> excuse me, and devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentations over him. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering into the house and hailing men and women committed them. To prison. He persecuted the church relentlessly right. without mercy. He consented unto Stephen's death. Strong says consent here means that he either allowed it or he took joy in seeing Stephen's death. That's a, that's a, I don't take joy in seeing anybody's death, but that's a hardened, a hardened man right there. But something changed one day on the road to Damascus when the light you know, shone down upon uh, Saul that day, and he became Paul. When Jesus stepped in on the scene and he turned Paul's life around, his, cor his course was changed from tearing the church down to now being one of its biggest proponents, but being one of its greatest builders for building people up for witnessing and to ministry. What a change that was. Acts 20, 19 through 24 says, Serving the Lord with all humility of mind and with many tears and temptations which befell me by the lying and weight of the Jews and how I kept nothing back that was profitable unto you but have showed you and have taught you publicly and from house to house testifying both to the Jews and also the Greeks repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. This is quite a bit of a change from Acts chapter 8 we just read. He says, Say that the Holy Ghost witnesses in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions abide me. But none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy and <clears throat> excuse me, my ministry, which I have received of the Lord Jesus, has testified the gospel of the grace of God. He said, I faced troubles, I faced trials, I was tempted, but yet I continued to serve with humility. I hid nothing from you guys. I taught you publicly, and I taught you from house 
to house I taught you in your own homes. I testified and I preached to all men and I have done the work of the Lord. And he says, I don't know what all is in front of me. In every city I go to, I'm told by the Holy Ghost that bonds and afflictions abide in me. When the Lord gave me this point, it made me, you know, my allergies act up just a little bit. Amen. The very same punishment, Paul saying, the very same punishments that I used to deal out to the church, that's now what I have to look forward to. But verse 24 starts with that magic word, but. He says, but none of these things move me. I don't count my life dear, this life on earth. I do not value it. I've given up all of that so I can finish my course with joy. He let God in there and God changed his life and God changed his direction from being a murderer to being one of the greatest preachers that we've ever seen. I was talking to a guy the other day and somehow uh, Brother Steve Diatley got brought up and he said, he was talking about, he said, now I knew Steve when he was rough. He said, I'm talking rough, Steve Diatling, and how he used to be. But he said, now I don't know what got into him or what caused him to start going to church, but I'm really happy for him because he's a completely different man. He said, you talk to him now and all he wants to talk about is church. And at one point he was on the wrong course and that's something he's talked about many times in men's prayer service. But one day he answered the call just like Paul did and he allowed God to work and to change his direction. Now his course has been altered. And if he keeps persevering, he's gonna finish that course, the same course that Paul completed. And the cool thing about walking with God is that you never ever have to walk alone and that you're never gonna get lost because he'll never lead you astray. Now, of course, the whole key to that plan is you actually have to be walking with God in your daily walk. Amen. Even when it comes down to the hard times. We've all done something that's embarrassed us or, or something that you know we deeply regret. You know, some people feel guilty about cheating a teacher out of $5 in, in sixth grade for reading and they get, they get sweaty feet. We may have heard that story a, a time or two, Brother Dwayne. <laughs> but imagine being someone like Paul. Imagine being in Paul's shoes, looking out over a church congregation that not too long ago, you were the one who just wreaked havoc and persecuted that church may have seen those that he had thrown in prison, the ones he had beaten, the ones, you know, maybe he even saw Stephen's loved ones and his friends and his family, we don't know. He may have seen the families of the people that he had himself tortured and had pressed to commit blasphemy the, that he knew was the unforgivable sin, the pressure, the shame, and the guilt that he must have felt. He could have let that hold him back, <clears throat> excuse me, and you know, stopped him from going forward but yet he continued to press on. And if God can help someone like Paul, why do you think he can't help someone like you? Some people let their baggage, let their past hold them back. But God's saying, they're saying, he said, give it all to me, cast all your cares upon me. Any burdens, any baggage, anything you've got, my shoulders are strong enough to take it. You don't have to carry it. All you have to do is come to me and let me set your path straight. Let me set you on that straight and narrow path. Like I said, like, like Paul, it's not about where you start or where you're at. It's all about where you finish the race. 1 Timothy 1, 12 through 16 says, And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who hath enabled me, for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry, who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord, excuse me, and the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love which is in Christ Jesus. This is a, a faithful saying and worthy of all, uh, <coughs> excuse me, acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Howbeit for this cause I obtained mercy that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. He's like, guys, I was a, a wretched man in Romans. He says, oh, wretched man that I am. I did terrible things, but one day the Lord looked down upon me. He enabled me. He's the one that took this wretched man and he made me a preacher. He made me profitable to the ministry. I was the chief of sinners, but God's grace is even greater than the things that I did in my past. I obtained mercy and now Jesus Christ is using me as an example to show that he is long-suffering, that he can take this wretched man 
and make him useful to that ministry. And if God can change my path, he's used me as an example. If he can change me, he can change anyone. It's sad when you hear people say that I'm too far gone, that there's no hope for me. Or you don't know exactly what I've done in my past. And I'm just going to tell you, God already knows. And he already saw every single thing that you did. And you know what? As long as it ain't blasphemy. He's, he's ready to forgive every sin. No matter how wretched and vile and disgusting you were, God is able to cleanse you. With, he's able to cleanse you every single time. Another wicked man that we've talked about before was Manasseh, but the Lord gave it to me again to talk to him. So I'll just give you a refresher just on how wicked the people of Israel were in his time. That's Jeremiah 23, 10 through 14. And it says, For the land is full of adulterers, for because of swearing the land mourneth, the pleasant places of the wilderness are dried up, and their course is evil, and their force is not right. For both prophet and priest are profane. Yea, in my house have I found their wickedness, saith the Lord. Wherefore their way shall be unto them as slippery ways in the darkness. They shall be driven on and fall therein. For I will bring evil upon them, even the year of their visitation, saith the Lord. And I have seen folly in the prophets of Samaria. They prophesied in Baal and caused my people to err. I have, also, excuse me, I have seen also in the prophets of Jerusalem a horrible thing. They commit adultery, walk in lies. They strengthen also the hands of evildoers, that none doth return from his wickedness. They are all of them unto me as Sodom, and the inhabitants thereof as Gomorrah. People in that day were so wicked that in God's eyes they were no different than the people of Sodom and Gomorrah. The, the, the Bible says that Manasseh seduced the people to sin. He made his own son pass before fire to the false god Moloch. And Carthage, which is in northern Africa, it was founded by the Phoenician people who you know, themselves came from what's modern day Lebanon, parts of Syria, and, and the tip of northern Israel. So all the cultures, all the people, they were all intermingled there. You know, they had the same beliefs and customs, traditions. And, and Carthage and other places around, there are stories of families who decided they wanted to have a child specifically to sacrifice to their God. Sometimes in Carthage it's called Cronus, you know, the, there are different names. Um, but apparently it was very common throughout that part of the world. And I, and I myself don't enjoy talking about this stuff, you know, child sacrifice. But you have to just understand how wicked the people were of that time. Parents committed to have a child. Mothers carried the kid for nine months, they nurtured it, they raised it to whatever the specific age was, and they all did it to have the child ready for sacrifice to a false god. What an evil generation. Yet even when Manasseh fell so far into sin, and he, it was the people who decided to sin, Manasseh was right there with him. When he had fallen into that sin, as deep as sin as probably anybody could get that we've seen, he, he gave David a run for his money, I believe, I believe he outdid him. God still did not write off Manasseh. He spent years defiling the things of God. He set up groves. He set up idol worship. And even in the temple, God's temple, he set up these false things. It said he shed blood and he sacrificed his own son to Mon. The Bible said that God tried to warn Manasseh and the people, but they would not hearken unto the words of the Lord. So God sent in their enemies and they carried Manasseh away in change. In the middle of his captivity, though, watch what happens in 2 Chronicles 33, 12 through 16. And when he was in affliction, when he was in great trial, when he was in bondage, he besought the Lord his God and humbled himself greatly before the God of his fathers and prayed unto him, and he was entreated of him and heard his supplication and brought him again to Jerusalem and to his kingdom. Then Manasseh knew that the Lord, he was God. Now after this, he built a wall without the city that he rebuilt the walls of the city of David and, and Nicholas or J.B., whoever's back there, y'all can skip to verse 15. It says, and he took away the strange gods and idol out of the house of the Lord and all the altars that he had built in the mount of the house of the Lord and in Jerusalem and cast them out of the city. And he repaired the altar of the Lord and sacrificed thereon peace offerings and thank offerings and commanded Judah to serve the Lord God of Israel. What a change 
God made in that man's life. The wickedest king there ever was. He reigned years and years, and he ignored God's word, and he ignored God's warnings to him. Now he was in chains. He saw the consequences of his action, and he does the one thing he probably had not done before in his life. He gets down, and he sought after God. He said, the Bible said he humbled himself greatly. He abased himself before God. He admitted his fault, and then he prayed. And God heard his single prayer that day, that evening, whenever it was, and God delivered him out of captivity. Then he knew, and the Bible says, he knew the Lord. He was God. And then the Bible, it, it went from saying he served Baal and all these false gods to saying the Lord his God. There was a change made in Manasseh's life. Then he said about cleansing the, land, cleansing the land of every single thing that he had spent all those years defiling it with. He got rid of idol worship. He repaired the altar. He once again restored sacrifice unto God at the temple. He commanded the people to serve the one true living God. God changed his direction from one single prayer, from one event of him humbling himself before God. When Manasseh got serious and got down to business with God, that's when God began to move for him. He went from being the lowest of the low, the most vile that we've ever seen probably, to now he was a man that was able to walk upright. He reigned for 55 years, and I don't know at what point in his reign, it's not really mentioned in history, the exact dates when he was put into captivity and when he turned to God, but I do know that his story ended a whole lot different than when it started. And I'm uh, working on closing here, coming down to the end. If y'all can go to 1 Corinthians 9 and 24. It says, Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize, so run that ye may obtain. Only the winner that run in the race receives that prize. Run that ye may obtain that prize. Keep pressing to the finish line so that you can receive that reward. Paul said, I press. I press towards the mark. I press towards the goal of the prize. I want to receive that reward. I'm going to keep on pressing and running that race. Just keep on pressing, running your race day after day. Continue on that course because, like I said, only the winners are the ones that receive the prize. Remember that commercial. Only winners get sprinkles. If you guys want the sprinkles of God, the blessings of God, you've got to win the race. Examine where you are on your course. If you look straight ahead, can you see the finish line in the distance? Or have you wandered off path and completely gone the opposite way? Amen. It's up to you, you know, where you want to end your race. That, you know, the Bible says work out your own salvation with fear. And show me it's completely up to you where you want to spend eternity. Paul said, let us run this race with patience that's set before us. It's a marathon. It's not a 40-yard dash. It's a 24-7 type of race and it, you have to keep pressing and pressing if you want to make it across that finish line but if we keep pressing if we keep doing what God wants us to do we know he's right there with us driving home yesterday I heard a, a where we've been out of church I've heard a song that I hadn't heard in probably about a year now and says how great it is to serve a living God who knows each breath I take and every step I've tried. How great it is to have a God that wants to run that race every single day with you, that he cares for us, that he wants to spend eternity with me and you. If you examine yourself and you see right now you're not exactly where you're supposed to be on that course, it's not too late for you to ask him to set your course right, to get down like Manasseh did and fix things. And right now you can humble yourself greatly just exactly like Manasseh did and pray. Confess your shortcomings to God. Ask him for guidance to help him with your race to keep you focused on that finish line. Some of us may hit a, a small stumbling block in our lives and, and others may go completely astray. God is able to deliver each and every single one of us. He's able to pick us up and turn us around to focus on that finish line and just keep pressing forward. And no matter what gets in the way, just keep plowing forward to that finish line so you, that one day you can finish your course. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, God, we love you, God. We thank you. I thank you for your mercy, your grace, your blessing, everything you've done, God. Thank you for your word today. God, help us to, to get our eyes fixed upon you like we talked about this week. God, get in the vision. God, get heaven focused on our vision that we can finish that course, that we can run that race that is set before us. God, give us the endurance. God, give us the patience to, to run this thing, to see it through to them because we don't want to be like those that give up 
at the last minute, God, those that turn away right at the last moment who have put so much time into this thing, God. God, we know you can bring back our lost loved ones who have once ran this race, God, who have given up on it, but you can turn it around just like you did with Paul and like you did with Manasseh and all the others and Zacchaeus and all of them in the Bible, that the ones that you've made the change in their life. We've seen so many in our church, God, that talk about how rough they once lived, God, but now that you, they let you in their lives, God, that you changed them, you took them, you turned them around from who they once were, and you can do that with our unsaved loved ones. As the pastor said, all the sorry in the church, God, you can straighten all of them out, God, and help us do what it takes to make heaven our home. God, again, we ask Lord to bless the church. God, keep us united, keep us faithful, keep your, keep us faithful in watching these videos and, and, and listening to it and heeding your words, not just being hearers of the word, but actually doing that word. God, give the pastor wisdom and knowledge during this time. Touch all those that are suffering with these diseases, all those that, that have lost loved ones. God, you can comfort them. God, speak that word of healing to get this thing away. God, we give you all the praise and the glory for it, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Church, I love you. Hope to see you soon. God bless you. We can